Hello, everyone, and welcome back to day three of NASA Earth Applied Sciences Week. This week, we're celebrating the many ways NASA Earth Science helps make our world a better place. Thank you again to everyone attending our presentations today. My name is Sydney Neukebauer. I'm a fellow with the NASA Developed National Program at Langley Research Center, and I am your MC for this week. Thank you in advance for your patience with any technical difficulties we may encounter, but we've been having a great week so far, so fingers crossed it continues. And of course, a few housekeeping items before we begin. Everyone is automatically muted, uh, so we invite you to use the chat function for any questions, and we hope you'll connect with us in the breakout sessions at 2.15 p.m. Eastern time today. For a complete agenda and links to the breakout rooms, as well as to participate in our Mapathon this week, please visit the event webpage or check out the handouts in the GoToWebinar panel. We'll also post the links to the breakout rooms in the chat here at the end of our presentations today. So now I'll hand it over to Lawrence Friedel, Director of NASA's Applied Sciences Program for our opening remarks. Thanks, Lawrence. Great, thank you, Sydney. And uh, welcome to day three. Um, actually, welcome to those people who are joining anew. Uh, and welcome back to those people who have participated on Monday and or, and or Tuesday. Uh, on behalf of NASA, we're really pleased to showcase the ways that people are, are making innovative and, and practical uses of Earth science data. Uh, I would say this program is one of many ways that NASA and the government um, work with partners to really serve the public. And I have to say that I am really, really proud of the work uh, that this team does. So we're excited to show you about it. Um, today, we have 11 talks, including four from DEVELOP. And we also have talks about our work in Africa, our work with global partners, uh, as well as the efforts related to data systems. So I mentioned DEVELOP, which I have to say is not an acronym. Uh, it's the name of one of the programs within Applied Sciences. Uh, and people in DEVELOP pursue a 10-week project working with a partner organization or more than one uh, to apply Earth observations and geospatial data. Uh, and so this week is the capstone event for the participants in the summer term for DEVELOP. Uh, so we have 16, I'm sorry, 65 developers uh, and 15 projects. And so I am proud to wear another DEVELOP shirt today. This is a little different than one on Tuesday, but uh, um, thank you for the DEVELOP team and all the work that, that you all do. Um, each day I'm also giving a challenge to the developers uh, knowing that this is the capstone event on, on Tuesday. It was about communications and crafting narratives. Uh, and today it's about perspectives, uh, especially particularly user perspectives. Uh, and so in applied sciences, we really try to start from the user end of things. Um, that requires listening and understanding uh, the perspectives that the users have, uh, understanding what are the issues that they're facing and a large part of it is understanding their language and, and their lexicon and yes, their acronyms. Uh, and so these are some of the key lessons that we've learned by doing applications over all these different years. Um, and so some of the things we've also learned is that we need to go to where the partners meet. Uh, we need to go out to where the managers and where the users, where the conferences, the annual meetings that, that they hold uh, that helps us engage them on their turf. Um, we get to learn the issues, we get involved in the committees, uh, and, and essentially it gives us a way to sort of build trust uh, in their communities. Uh, and I would say many of the teams in applied sciences do this really well. Um, one I really want to highlight is the health and air quality team. Um, they get involved with a number of different associations every year going to their meetings. So the um, um, Air and Waste Management Association, the American Public Health Association, the American Thoracic Society, uh, and even the last couple of years, the American Mosquito Control Association, uh, since there's lots of infectious diseases that are transmitted by mosquitoes. Uh, the other thing that they and their program have done is help their, the, the, the project teams publish uh, in the trade journals that these associations have. And so this is one of the things that we've learned is a really a good way to help get the connections with the users. And we encourage you to do that in whatever field you go into, when you have customers or clients, really go to where those customers and clients are, are meeting. The other thing about per perspective, I would say, is if you're interested in policy, um, I, I, I would really encourage you uh, 
to take some economics courses and maybe even some statistics courses. The one thing we've learned about policy is that it is very much an economics-based language. And so if you're involved with environmental work or geospatial and, and others, and you're interested in marrying that with policy work, um, we encourage you to get the perspective from economics because uh, we think it'll be a, a nice blend. The other thing we would just sort of say is policy is diverse. It is not monolithic. Um, a lot of people think about congressional legislation as policy, and that's just one of many, many, many. Um, there's lots of policy being made at federal agencies, at state and local governments, even building codes is something you could see as a policy. Uh, to really think of you to, to think of it more broadly. So I hope all the developed people can reflect on this uh, and that you can continue to build your user perspectives and the empathy and also especially learning languages of the groups you wanna be going into. Develop is just one part of this week uh, and one part of the Applied Scientist program. And so now it's my pleasure to introduce Emily Seidler Glassman to tell you more about the Applied Scientist program. Uh, for all intents and purposes, Emily is the Deputy Director for Applied Sciences. And so over to you, Emily. Thanks, Lawrence. Um, and uh, day three, this has been an amazing Applied Sciences week. I'm really excited to see uh, what comes today. Um, for those of you who've heard this presentation for the past couple of days, I'll try to go uh, really fast um, and feel free to zone out for a minute or two. Um, and for those of you that are new, welcome. I'm so excited to tell you about our program. Next slide, please. So zooming out, we sit within NASA's Earth Science Division, which has an amazing mission to understand this planet from all, from all the different timescales and all the different processes, and to use that knowledge to, uh, to benefit society and to benefit life on our planet. So what do we do? We develop, launch, and operate a fleet of Earth-observing satellites, instruments on those satellites, and also airborne instruments. We develop and test scientific technology. We support research that advances humanity's understanding of the Earth as a system. And we encourage the innovative and practical use of that knowledge um, for, to benefit people. Next slide, please. So while we're here for Applied Sciences Week, Applied Sciences is one of four elements of NASA's Earth Science Division, and we really work together as, as puzzle pieces, and it's really through the interaction between each of these four programs that we are able to create benefit. So in addition to the Applied Sciences, there's the Flight and Data Systems Program. So they are the ones that actually develop, launch, and operate the Earth observing satellites and manage the data systems so that anyone in the world can get NASA's data, which is freely and open openly available to everyone, which I think is just tremendous. Um, there's also the research and analysis um, element of the Earth Science Division, and those are the folks that are funding and conducting that fundamental Earth science knowledge um, to understand how do all these systems, the cryosphere, the atmosphere, water, how do they all fit together? Um, in addition, we also have the technology office, and these are the folks that are looking 20 years in the future and saying, what are the technologies that we're going to need, and what do we need to do now to get bring those to fruition. And so these different elements fit together because they we inspire one another and we help one another overcome barriers. So for example, there might be new research that inspires an application. It might be that we see the potential for an application but are hindered by a, a lack of a technology development. Maybe that we understand that, that we have data and it's ready to use, but it's just not in a format that the people who could really benefit from it um, know how to work with. And so it's really feedback and interaction between these parts that make us all uh, move the ball forward. Next slide, please. So within the Applied Sciences program, we're trying to help people use all of this amazing data that NASA collects. And we provide support and funding to help both individuals and institutions make better decisions about the environment, food, water, health, and safety. And I have icons for the six program elements that we have here below. I hope you were able to hear on Monday the program managers speak about each of their programs um, because they just have uh, such a wealth of knowledge and, and are really doing, as Lawrence mentioned, really innovative things in each of these areas. Capacity building, disasters, health and air quality, water resources, ecological food forecasting, and food security and agriculture. Next slide, please. And um, big shout out to the Capacity Building Program, which has largely taken the lead on Applied Sciences Week, and a big welcome to the developers that are here. Uh, uh, we know that you're improving the capabilities of individuals and institutions to access and apply Earth observations, and, and you all do a tremendous job at it. 
So thank you and thanks specifically to all the organizers today. Next slide, please. So what do we do? We make investments in projects and in people and in teams to develop innovative and practical uses of Earth observations. And we work throughout the mission development life cycle of our satellite. So we uh, work from the very beginning when we're trying to figure out what satellite are we going to build, what measurements are, is it going to collect, to how do we get people prepared to use the data from that satellite. Next slide, please. And finally, in my last 30 seconds or so, I just want to say we're so excited you're here. I want to thank you for joining us in this mission, and I can't wait to see how you're using NASA's Earth observations to improve life in your, uh, on our planet. Look forward to meeting as many of you as we can and are excited to see how we can work together. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Emily and Lawrence. So we will now move into our thematic highlights for the day. Today's presentations are organized by their geographic focus on the central United States and Africa. So we'll kick off the presentations today with Greta Paris, a participant with the NASA developed national program at Marshall Space Flight Center. Hello, everybody. My name is Greta Paris. I am here on behalf of Sabine Nix, Thomas Quintero, and Amanda Tomlinson. We are the Huntsville Urban Development Team, where we study the urban heat island effect in Huntsville, Alabama. Next slide, please. So about 20 million hectares of forest are projected to be lost in the United States due to population growth and associated urban expansion by the year 2040. So Huntsville is the fastest growing city in Alabama and they have experienced rapid urban expansion between the years of 2010 and 2020. And this has many citizens concerned about tree canopy loss. So tree canopy loss could be resulting in an enhanced urban heat island effect and the urban heat island effect takes place when urban areas have higher temperatures than surrounding more rural or forested areas. And the urban heat island effect can lead to health issues for those with existing medical conditions such as COPD, diabetes, or asthma. So our team partnered with the city of Huntsville to examine the effects of urban expansion on potential tree canopy loss and the resulting urban heat island effect. And I would like to note that this was the city's first investigation into this issue, so uh, we were very excited to work with them. Next slide, please. So our team used several different NASA satellites and sensors to um, examine the urban heat island effect in Huntsville. We used Landsat 5TM and Landsat 8 OLI to examine land cover throughout the, the study period. And we used Landsat 5TM, Landsat 8 Tiers, Terramotis, and ISS EcoStress to examine land surface temperature throughout the study period. And finally, we used ISS JEDI to analyze tree canopy density and height. And JEDI is pretty new. Um, it uses LIDAR to measure 25 meter footprint resolution to gather information on tree canopy. So all of the Earth observations that were used in this project were acquired and processed within Google Earth Engine, with the exception of um, Terramotis, ISS EcoStress, and ISS JEDI, which were acquired through uh, USGS Appears and NASA Earth Data. So all of our Google Earth Engine imagery was cloud masked and reduced by calculating monthly medians. And using this imagery, we conducted two types of classifications based on the National Land Cover Database land cover classes, and we calculated land surface temperature. Next, the team acquired data requ related to heat vulnerability from the CDC, U.S. Census Bureau, and the city of Huntsville. Specifically, we looked at health data and populations over the age of 65, and this data was calculated or was collected <laughs> at the census tract level, and our remotely sensed data was averaged over census tracts to be used in analysis with the heat vulnerability data. So our team produced several end products, um, such as urban heat identification maps, tree canopy cover survey maps, urban heat urban heat health risk maps, and a time series analysis of land surface temperature and land cover, and finally, an ArcGIS story map to serve as a community outreach tool. Next slide, please. So the map in the upper left corner demonstrates tree canopy cover change from 2010 to 2019. So we found that tree canopy cover in the Huntsville area has overall been increasing according to our supervised classification scheme. However, some census tracts show steep decreases in tree cover. We found that land surface temperature was negatively correlated with tree cover and our studies show that this relationship is likely logarithmic, meaning that tree cover can dramatically decrease surface temperature in heavily developed areas. So in the bottom left corner, you can see how trees detected from Jedi LIDAR cool the surrounding area, especially in dense tree canopies. So trees in the Huntsville area were found to be on average 82 feet high, and they have a mean plant area index of three, meaning that there are at least three layers of tree canopy between the sun and the ground for a given tree. Next slide, please. 
So the map in the upper left corner demonstrates the change in land surface temperature between the years of 2010 to 2019. And as we can see, every census tract within the study area experienced an increase in land surface temperature over this time frame. And on average, this increase was about four degrees Fahrenheit, but some census tracts experienced increases of up to eight degrees Fahrenheit. So while these increases in land surface temperature may not seem substantial, urban heat is not experienced equivalently by everyone, and many of the tracts that were experiencing the highest increase in land surface temperature are also the most vulnerable to heat-related illnesses. So the map in the lower left corner incorporates health data, including rates of asthma, COPD, diabetes, um, and other illnesses, um, along with land surface temperature and other environmental variables to better understand which census tracts are the most at risk for heat-related illnesses. So our partners at the city of Huntsville are interested in mitigating the effects of the urban heat island effect through tree planting and increasing urban green spaces. And the results of our project um, demonstrate which areas that these mitigation efforts would best be targeted in order to most effectively reduce the rate of risk or reduce the risk of heat related illnesses. Next slide, please. So we just wanna say thank you so much to all of our developed mentors and advisors and our partners at the city of Huntsville. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Greta, and great work to your team. So next, we're going to turn to our health and air quality highlight from Dr. Mike Wimberly, a professor at the University of Oklahoma Department of Geography and Environmental Sustainability. Thank you for joining us, Mike. Mike, it looks like you are muted. There we are. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. We're in business. Let's go. Uh, thanks. It is great to, uh, it's great to be here. Let me see. Do I have uh, control over the? Oh, here it is. Oh, no. Do we'll I have? We'll be putting the slides for you. Oh, okay. Just, just say next okay. slide, and we'll, we got it. All right. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, some work uh, supported by NASA Applied Sciences that uh, my group has been doing for a while. Um, now looking at. Uh, a multi-state project for West Nile virus forecasting in the United States. Next slide, please. So this story uh, about West Nile virus, uh, which is uh, a tropical uh, mosquito-borne disease that can be traced back to Africa, starts in uh, South Dakota, of all places. So West Nile virus, although you know we've probably heard a lot more about other diseases like Zika, in recent years. Uh, West Nile is still uh, the most widespread uh, mosquito-borne disease in the United States. And if you look at the map, the incidence is particularly high of all places uh, in the Great Plains, particularly the Northern Great Plains. Uh, South Dakota has had uh, thousands of cases, um, you know, several thousand cases, including many severe neuroinvasive cases and deaths. It doesn't seem like a big number, but when you consider that South Dakota has less than a million people, it's actually for the U.S. very high incidence, uh, annual incidence of uh, what can be a severe and deadly mosquito-borne disease. And, and one of the challenges in working with West Nile virus is it's incredibly variable. So, you know, just as one example in South Dakota, in 2011, there were two cases. And, uh, you know, by the end of 2011, we'd kind of forgotten about, or a lot of people had forgotten about West Nile virus. And then it came roaring back with uh, more than 200 cases and a number of deaths in 2012. So part of the challenge has been, you know, can we get some kind of a look ahead and get an understanding of what the upcoming year is gonna bring. Is it gonna be a really bad season or maybe not so bad? Next slide. Uh, the connection with NASA is through uh, environmental drivers of the disease. So if we look at, uh, for example, a couple of basic environmental parameters, temperature and precipitation, they, and we look over to the right, we've got humans, which is, so we're interested in looking at risk to humans, and we have a transmission system that involves mosquitoes, uh, a virus, and also in the case of West Nile birds that are the zoonotic reservoir hosts from the disease, and the uh, variety of natural habitats in which these organisms live. 
Uh, if we look at temperature, it has numerous direct effects on the mosquito, affecting growth rates, mortality, biting rates, even the rate of virus development inside the mosquito. Uh, extreme heat, particularly drought, also has a big impact on the bird populations, which can fluctuate a lot from year to year. When we look at uh, temperature and precipitation combined, we know from biogeography, these have a big effect on the vegetation that provides habitat for these species. Uh, the, you know, the water balance that influences larval habitats for mosquitoes. And the basic idea here is if you look at the bottom, there's a time lag. It takes some time for the effects of the environment to percolate through all of these effects on habitat and organisms. So the idea is that, well, you know, if we can track these environmental factors, maybe they can give us a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit of lead time, a warning ahead of time of what's likely to happen in terms of the transmission system and how it affects uh, the susceptibility of humans. Next. So uh, one of the challenges is, you know, we don't have necessarily a great way to measure a virus like, uh, or any kind of virus, whether it's the COVID virus or, uh, or West Nile virus. So if we look at this figure, you look on the left. So I would argue that looking for a virus in South Dakota or the U.S. or anywhere is kind of like hunting for a needle in a haystack. And there are kind of two main ways that we can uh, look through this haystack. So if you look at the bottom, going back to the previous slide, we can monitor these environmental risk factors, temperature, precipitation, humidity. Uh, and then if we do that, they give us one picture of the disease. You look at that kind of funky colored haystack. So it tells us something, but it's a little bit of a distorted picture of the disease because they're only looking at it in terms of the environmental potential for transmission. We can also put mosquito traps out, trap mosquitoes, take them into the lab, test them. And that gives us a very precise uh, picture of whether we have the virus or not at a particular location. We know whether or not we can find it in the mosquitoes. However, uh, we can only get a look at, you know, a few very isolated portions of the haystack. So our overall approach to this problem is we're going to take all the information that we can get to make forecasts, put it together. And if you look all the way on the right, the idea is that by blending these sources of information, leveraging the Europe observations, as well as mosquito surveillance, we can get a better reconstruction of that haystack and hopefully know where West Nile is. Next, please. And you know, what our data has shown is that this is in fact true, we can test this. So if you look at these scatter plots, these are from predictive models and I'm not gonna go into the underlying details, but so on the left, we have essentially uh, observed, more or less observed numbers of cases on the X axis, predicted number of cases on uh, the Y axis, and if we try to make predictions based only on what we can observe in the mosquitoes, uh, you know, there's a relationship, but it's not the best. Things seem to flatten out, particularly at uh, higher levels of disease transmission. If we use only meteorological data or Earth observation data from satellites, you know, again, we can kind of split things into two groups, high and low. But, uh, you know, we can't distinguish things more finely. But on the right, if we put those together, we actually start doing a pretty good job of separate, you know, clearly separating high and low years. And then also uh, being able to tell some of the variation within those two clusters. So, you know, we can show that this approach works. Next, please. Uh, so to implement this, uh, this is software that we've developed. It's implemented in uh, the R language in a script that, uh, you know, automatically does all of the model fitting, forecasting, and report generation. If you look at the top, uh, we've got mosquito infection data, daily weather data, and we can constrain our future estimates a little bit based on long range weather forecasts. And what we're predicting 
is all the way on the right. We want to predict the burden of human cases. Now you can see we've got a couple of pathways there, the blue boxes and the dashed lines. That's historical data that we use to calibrate the model. And so this year in 2020, if you look at uh, the gray boxes and the solid lines, we're collecting data in near real time, feeding it into the models, and we're using that to make predictions that include, uh, if you look at the bottom, risk maps that tell us uh, at a county level what the relative risk of uh, transmission is. And also we can extrapolate all the way forward to the end of the West Nile virus season, the end of the summer to get a sense, is this gonna be a big outbreak here or not? Next slide, please. And uh, so if you look here on the right, these are a couple of the forecasts for South Dakota and for Louisiana that we've generated just recently. I, I don't have time to get into a lot of the details, but uh, you know, a couple of things that I would point out, you can see that you know, with these models, we can fit them pretty well to the historical data. You see a, a number of lines. We're actually working now with an ensemble of different models. And it, as you can see, uh, you know, we get pretty good agreement, even when we use slightly different uh, modeling approaches. But by looking across multiple models, we can get, you know, make stronger inference about um, what the environmental relationships are. And then if you look at that orange uh, band on the right, those are predictions that we've made, uh, you know, earlier in July for the 2020 West Nile virus season. And we're doing this in a number of places. Like I said, We've started out in South Dakota. They continue to use the system. We're continuing to support them. Uh, our current NASA supported work is focused on uh, some comparisons with Louisiana, which also has relatively high uh, rates of West Nile virus transmission, but has a different uh, transmission environment. So we've got a virtual collaboration going on with the Louisiana Department of Health. Um, you know, we've had some other things going on as well. Michigan is now using this system. And they're basically, uh, they're using it themselves. You know, we don't have, instead of us taking their data, we basically gave, have given them the software, we've trained them up on it. And uh, that's been quite uh, successful to see that we've been able to engage with new partners and they've been able to take the tools and run with them. Uh, we're doing something similar in Oklahoma. We're working with the scientists at Southern Nazarene University and the Oklahoma City a Department of Health. So, uh, you know, in general, it's been uh, a success in that we have been able to successfully make predictions and, uh, you know, the information has proven to be useful. Next slide, please. Uh, and just to, you know, to finish up, this is my last slide, but this is kind of the who cares slide. You know, okay, you're doing this, this is cool. Why does it matter? I would say, you know, two reasons that it matters. Uh, one is that as similar to what we see when we look at, uh, you know, at COVID cases these days, there's a delay in reporting. So when we look at human West Nile virus cases and we look at them coming in during the summer, we're looking in the rearview mirror at what happened weeks to months ago. Uh, so if you look, you know, looking at the box on the right, 2018 was a good example. We were well into the West Nile, you know, into the West Nile virus season. Eight cases had been reported in mid to late July. In fact, there had already been uh, 50 cases that had actually occurred. Uh, so, but our model had actually successfully predicted that it previously that that was going to be a high uh, transmission season. So that was extremely useful. The other thing that we run into is uh, the other issue that we run into is. And particularly in South Dakota, we tend to get the peak of mosquitoes before the main West Nile virus transmission system uh, season, I'm sorry. And those mosquitoes that peak tend to be nuisance mosquitoes that actually don't transmit the virus. So, you know, we need uh, technology to bring together the earth observations, the mosquito surveillance data to make these predictions because without it, we're very much blind to what's happening with West Nile virus. And uh, that is it. I think we've got the final slide next. And there are some places you can look, uh, you know, feel free to contact me if you want more info. Great, thank you so much, Mike. 
So up next, we're going to hear from Spencer Nelson, another developed participant, this time from our Arizona location. Go ahead, Spencer, thank you. All right, thank you, Sydney. Um, okay. As uh, Sydney said, uh, my name is Spencer. I'm representing our team at uh, the Arizona Tempe node, uh, Satellite Beach Energy, restructuring the energy balance in Satellite Beach, Florida by quantifying solar energy production potential using NASA powered data products and LIDAR. So for this project, we partnered with the government officials of at the city of Satellite Beach, Florida and the city of Orlando, Florida Fleet and Facilities Management Division to help measure solar energy potential of rooftops. The city of Satellite Beach is located on the central Atlantic coast of Florida the city has a population of 11,000 residents, receives 239 sunny days a year, and has a mean summer high temperature of 91 degrees Fahrenheit. The city of Satellite Beach has a goal to reach 100% renewable energy by 2050. Since wind energy is not a viable option, they plan to achieve this goal via solar. The city seeks to find the most efficient way to install rooftop PV or photovoltaic panels. The city of Satellite Beach is also interested in understanding the impact that urban heat has on energy consumption. We developed a method to quantify the solar potential throughout the city of Satellite Beach using, sorry, using a uh, NASA prediction of worldwide energy resources, also known as NASA Power Solar Irradiance data set and high resolution LIDAR data. We made this analysis reproducible through a code-based tool. The process and outcomes of this analysis are available in a story map, which is meant for the community of Satellite Beach. Next slide, please. In order to calculate PV potential, we first created a digital surface model or DSM using LIDAR point data given to us by the city of Satellite Beach. As indicated on the flow chart, using the DSM, we ran a series of pre-processing steps to drive and smooth roof slope and direction, also known as the aspect of every pixel. We then extracted this data using a building footprint shapefile to generate polygons of roof segments given their unique aspects. We modified a Python script from NASA Power to extract monthly direct and diffuse solar irradiance and albedo from their API, and then ran them through a code that calculates hourly solar irradiance for the 15th day of each month using unique slope and aspect inputs. For each hour, the code retrieved information about the sun's position, which allowed us to perform a shading analysis on the DSM using Hillshade in Arc Pro. This is vital to understanding how much irradiance a panel would receive throughout the day. The hourly solar, solar irradiance outputs from that analysis were summed to the day and then assigned to the roof segments using the polygon file derived from the building footprints and slope aspect analysis. We used zonal statistics to select the majority value for each segment and multiplied by the area of that part of the roof to get a representative value of solar irradiance by roof segment. We then converted irradiance to PV potential by multiplying irradiance by a solar panel efficiency factor to get a daily PV potential for the 15th day of each month. Next, we sum these daily values for the 15th of each month by the number of days in that month and then summed the monthly values to get a general, to get an annual energy potential by segment. The segments of each building were then added to generate an annual energy potential by building. Next slide, please. And so here are some of our general findings and results from this project. We found that the annual cycle of energy potential was highest in the late spring and early summer, which may be due to a greater cloud cover in later summer months. For most of the year, south-facing roofs, indicated by the red line on, on the radar graph, produced the most PV potential. However, from April through August, north-facing roofs produced the most PV potential. Energy potential peaks in May for all segments, making it the month with the highest PV potential while December is the month with the lowest overall PV potential at only 44% of May's. South-facing roofs do notably better than all other aspects during the winter months. Annually, all segments produce over 200 million kilowatt hours of PV potential, which is enough to power nearly 20,000 average homes. Next slide, please. 
For the annual potential by roof segment, we, find, we found that south-facing roof segments produce the most PV potential annually with over 50 million kilowatt hours or 24% of all PV potential produced. It is also the highest average potential per segment at 11,000 kilowatt hours per year, which is enough to actually provide energy for the average household in the US. Flat roof segments produce the least PV potential at around 25 million kilowatt hours, or 12% of the overall PV potential, and the lowest average by segment at around 5,000 kilowatt hours, or just under half of the energy needed for an average household in a year. This could potentially be due to spacing requirements for flat roofs, which result in lower rooftop efficiencies. We determined that given Satellite Beach's average annual rooftop PV potential of 55,010 kilowatt hours per building, the average building could generate approximately five times the annual energy needs for an average household if PV panels were to be installed on all viable roof areas. The code and findings from this project will be used uh, by the city of Satellite Beach for where they may target solar panel projects to meet their goal of 100% renewable energy and will be conveyed in the public facing story map. And that's it, thank you. Thank you so much, Spencer. All right, now we're going to highlight disasters with a presentation from Dr. Maggie Glasgow, a geophysicist at JPL. Welcome, Maggie. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to be highlighting today some work that we did on the um, spring floods in Africa. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this past spring, um, there were some floods in Africa and uh, the countries particularly uh, Kenya, Somalia, Sudan, South Sudan, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo experienced severe flooding um, and uh, more widespread flooding than normal in their long rain season. Um, the NASA Disasters Program activated for this event um, and to investigate the effects of the flood and see how our products might aid in um, future flooding uh, events. Uh, during this event, um, they experienced transboundary flooding and food insecurity. Um, the rising waters um, impacted vulnerable settlements along riverbanks, and reports indicated that hundreds of people lost lives um, to overflowing rivers and mudslides, and thousands were displaced. Um, our NASA A37 project, Advancing Access to Global Flood Modeling and Alerting, um, investigated this event. Next slide, please. So, um, our project is using uh, the disaster aware um, uh, platform that um, Chris Chiesa um, described on Monday um, on the panel. If you were if you were participating, this is an open access global um, uh, disaster alerting system, and what we're doing is adding um, a flood alerting to this for affected dissemination of flood risks and potential impacts to aid in their emergency um, response. Um, we have four main components to this system, um, a model of models um, to forecast flood severity at global scale, integrating two flood models, um, GLOFAST and GFMS in near real time, and then two remote sensing aspects, um, one to derive flood inundation um, from earth observations and a second implementing machine learning um, to do flood-based damage assessment um, to uh, greater to identify um, greater impacts to vulnerable lo um, locations. Um, the fourth part of the project is to implement an end-to-end -end pipeline um, to integrate the above um, components into disaster aware. Central to the project is the incorporation of the flood model outputs um, and the uh, remote sensing derived outputs. Um, from multiple platforms to help with flood risk mitigation and to increase resilience of impacted communities. Um, and on the right, you can see um, the, uh, the number of um, flood um, that were floods that were impacting the um, 
uh, different um, areas in um, the various years. Okay, next slide, please. Oh, they just popped up. Okay, next slide. Okay, so what did we do for the flooding in East and, um, East and Central Africa? So the project um, uh, identified watersheds that were at risk um, over the course of the floods, um, and that would be in the left and um, uh, second um, panels. Um, and we uh, identified watches in red, warnings in orange, and advisories in green and converted those into alerts in the, um, the panel that has the dots. Um, and with that, you can um, upload those into disaster, the PDC Disaster Aware um, platform as alerts. And then um, we're also working on um, creating um, vulnerability maps, which is the far right panel, and um, trying to um, combine the alerting um, levels with a um, identification of uh, areas that are vulnerable to uh, exposure from these floods. Next slide, please. So the flooding in Africa led to exposure and risk to po vulnerable populations. And oftentimes these risks are compounded by multiple um, associated events, heavy rainfall causing both flooding and landslides. Um, and as you see, these watersheds that were at risk um, in the red, orange, and green um, are also identified with um, areas that were exposed in the bottom right um, panel. And if you go to this um, story um, that was published on the disasters website, you can read more about um, what we did here. So what we're trying to do is see how these cascading events are associated with um, floods to landslides to exposure. Um, next slide, please. So um, there are several um, projects that are being funded out of the disasters program under the A37 Roses call. Um, and these proposals were solicited for user-centric um, applications for research enabling risk-informed decisions and actions. And one of the, the, the key components of this call were multidisciplinary projects which harness the convergence of expertise and collaborative partnerships. So one of the things that we're working on is bringing together three teams, um, looking at uh, floods, landslides, and the associated exposure um, to see how we can look at cascading um, effects from these three different um, uh, dis uh, disasters and hazards. Um, so what we're doing is trying to leverage the expertise of the three different um, projects to conduct a study on an event that demonstrates these cascading hazards and um, investigate the um, associated exposure. Um, the three projects that are actively collaborating on the potential case study are um, my project, the Advancing Access to Global Flood Modeling and Alerting, um, and Dahlia Kirschbaum's project, the Development of Predictive Models to Improve Landslide Disaster and Risk Reduction and Response, and Charles Hike's project, um, Identifying Critical infrastructure exposure for disaster forecasting mitigation and response. Um, if you would like to see more information on this, uh, on these three projects and other projects that are within the disasters portfolio, you can see the um, more information on this at the website posted below disasters.nasa.gov um, slash portfolio. Um, next slide, please. And I believe that is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for your attention and I'll hand it back to Sydney, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Maggie. And I believe we'll actually be hearing a little bit more about one of the specific disasters projects you mentioned tomorrow at Applied Sciences Week. So be sure to tune in tomorrow as well. I believe we're now going to pause for just one moment to gather some feedback from our attendees. 
So please take a moment to respond to this poll and we will resume shortly. Great, thank you so much to everyone who contributed to our poll. So up next, we're going to highlight ecological forecasting with a presentation from Dr. Danielle Wood, Director of the Space Enabled Research Group at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. It's my honor to be with you today, representing an exciting team working together on this project entitled Designing Applications to Foster the Health of Terrestrial and wetland ecosystems in the coastal zone of West Africa. We're so thankful for the support from Applied Sciences and the Ecological Forecasting Team on this project, and we're so thankful for the collaboration of key organizations in both Benin and Ghana. While we're on this slide, I want to highlight in particular uh, this picture of Lake Nokwe, a major lake in the city of Cotonou in Benin, which is one of our focus areas. Note that we are studying wetland ecosystems, and one example is this area, which is a neighborhood here we're seeing a set of homes from a drone image produced by our team last year. What you're seeing are homes from above that are built on stilts over the lake, not too far from the shore, but obviously for these homes, one of the main ways to transport is by human powered boat. The lake is highly influenced by several unique features. One are local traditional fishing techniques where people create fishing ponds that are quite informal, but use techniques that are based on particular kinds of fish they seek to grow. And they use all kinds of materials from uh, whether it's plastics or local tree-based materials. We're also very interested in the behavior of a local plant, well, I should say an invasive plant that's become very active locally, the water hyacinth, and it has an impact in many countries in the area as well as around the world. So we'll be discussing how we're joining with local teams from companies and universities to highlight the use of satellite-based earth observation and other tools for observation of the earth uh, to help inform decision-making around these kinds of challenges. Next slide, please. A key aspect of this project is the large team that I represent, and I want to give credit to the organization. In particular, we're working in two countries, including Benin and Ghana in West Africa. In each country, this is one of the programs where it's really important for us to ask how the project contributes to both meeting and monitoring the sustainable development goals. I was so thankful to see that the Applied Sciences team, as well as the Ecological Forecasting team, highlighted the need to focus on the sustainable development goals as articulated by the United Nations. So in this case, uh, this is focused on sustainable development goal number 15, focusing on uh, ecological diversity and life on land. So we highlighted 15.1 and 15.8, looking at the health of forest in both countries, as well as the management of invasive plants. So in each local area, we found uh, some of the stakeholders that are most interested in these topics. In Ghana, we're working closely with the Ghanaian Statistical Service, and they are taking a key lead in coordinating the collection of data for the SDGs as well as we're working closely with the Ghana Space Science Technology Institute, which are also academic researchers like us. And we work closely also with other organizations uh, according to coordination with the local teams, including uh, those who are also doing related analysis uh, from universities and other government teams. In Benin, we're working with the national team that's focusing on making forest mapping. They're called Senatel, it's the National Remote Sensing Agency, as well as a team called Greenkeeper Africa. And they are a social enterprise applying the work directly to reduce the impacts of invasive plants. I want to acknowledge my co-authors, uh, Dr. Lola fatayimba Gay, David Lagamasina as well from East Carolina University, as well as a number of students, particularly from Oyemara, and Eric Ashcroft, who are also delighted to work with Blue Raster, a data analytics firm helping us translate our science results into very useful tools. Let me go on to the next slide. We can highlight some of our impact by focusing on the work of Greenkeeper Africa, they have identified this beautiful plant, which is both uh, exciting, but also really concerning. 
as a business model opportunity. And I was first invited to Benin by this team after speaking at a conference and had the opportunity to share the opportunity to use satellite Earth observation uh, for entrepreneurs at a conference hosted by the US government and the Indian government in India. I was so thankful to hear about the work of Greenkeeper Africa because they see that they can take this plant, which causes a lot of harm to the local ecosystem. It doesn't belong there, but was brought there by humans. And it causes concern for the health of fish, but it also has some properties, such as when you take it out of the water and dry it, it can be used to make uh, various commercial products. In particular, Greenkeeper Africa uses it to make products that can be dried and create absorbent material that can absorb oil-based pollution. This is actually quite useful because there are a number of organizations that might be companies or teams operating vehicles that may have regular or small or larger oil spills, but there are not consistent ways to address them or to mitigate the oil pollution. So Greenkeeper Africa is now both harvesting an invasive plant, but they also are a services company doing environmental services by helping clients and industry in both their country and also in other areas to clean up oil pollution. Next slide. When I met the Greenkeeper Africa team, they had not previously used earth observation and satellite data to understand the relationship between their larger ecosystem of the lake and nearby rivers uh, and this plant. Of course, they'd have all kinds of in-situ experience and the local communities are very familiar with the growth patterns of the lake. But one great question which we've been exploring with them for the last few years, they basically could tell us anecdotally that they felt that there had been an increase in the spread of this plant year over year in a seasonal pattern. They could tell us which months were most likely to be active growth for the plant, and they could tell us that there was impact of the hydrology uh, on the plant, meaning sometimes there's a seasonal tidal flows into the lake of different water with salinity levels that change. We also learned from local scientists at the university who are now collaborating with us informally, and they shared their research understanding how the salt level and temperature and oxygen levels in the lake influence the health of the plant. Now we're working all together and creating an online observatory that will include data from satellite sources, as well as from drones and in-situ water sensors. The local teams will carry on the local data collection using the drones and water sensors, and we've been prototyping the techniques to do that with them. And we've now developed a technique that can be an ongoing uh, data analysis process using data from Landsat and validated with data from Sentinel and from commercial sources like Planet. And we can create a long-term story uh, looking at the both historical and then current ongoing assessment on a month-by-month -month basis of the behavior of the plant and the amount of surface area covered by the lake. And this can both give a, a help for planning and also monitoring the harvesting effort by the company and the colleagues that do that, that harvesting from local communities. But it can also help us understand if there is indeed a scientifically demonstrated increase, uh, both in this area, but also nearby regions of the extent of this plant and understanding what is causing that because it's probably due to certain human activities that change the nitrogen levels in the lake. Next slide. This highlights our work particularly in Benin, and the ultimate piece will be to show uh, the results of the analysis by creating a very easy to use tool. Particularly, this is the role that Blue Raster will play. And our goal is to convert that science analysis into a very interactive tool that will be shared both with the company and nearby researchers, but also for the community more broadly. So eventually this will be a tool that can both show social stories like the benefits to local community members of cleaning up the plant and opportunities for creating jobs and different kinds of micro enterprises as well as an opportunity to show scientific data that's shared publicly and archived for long-term. We've had ongoing cycles of prototyping, getting user feedback, and we continue to do it. We're about in our fourth cycle now. It's a continuous process of improvement, and we look forward to sharing this as it develops. Next slide. Looking at our work in Ghana, one of the key motivating factors uh, is the concern about the kinds of mining that are often happening in Ghana. Now, of course, Ghana is a country that has exported gold for many years, and there are legal and appropriate ways to do gold mining as regulated by the Ghana Environmental Protection Agency. But there's also been a potential uptick in illegal or uh, non-compliant mining activities that are not following the national guidelines for clean mining. We have been working closely with the Ghana Statistical Service, the Ghana Space Science Technology Institute, and we've also compared findings with other researchers that are collaborating with other NASA teams, such as the SEVERE team is collaborating with uh, the Center for Remote Sensing and GIS. And all of us are developing techniques to help measure the extent of mining some of which, which is being done illegally. You can see here an example of our analysis, uh, highlighting uh, using satellite imagery, particularly from Landsat, but again, we can do some uh, follow-on validation with other data sources. This is showing analysis from 20, 2008 to 2017, and we looked at seven and eight from Landsat and highlighted the opportunity to classify uh, the different types of land and to look at which year uh, land was converted 
from vegetation into other areas like water left over from mining or in urban, uh, urban change or mining change. Often you're seeing mines that are built uh, in locations uh, near water because they're using water from the rivers in order to help with the processing of the mining. Next slide. We can further show some of the results uh, by highlighting the timeline. And here you see one of the ways we're trying to present the information, showing the different colors, identifying what type of land was converted from vegetation into mining at different years. And as you'd expect, if you imagine a river going through the center of this and branching off, early on it's very close to the water and it branches out over time. In the bottom left-hand corner of the slide, I'm here showing one of our techniques for improving our validation because our classification was done partly with machine learning. So we want to then go back and use high resolution satellite data, identify locations where we have commercial data that we can uh, then check to see if we get the same results in terms of the type of land use, whether it's uh, water or mining or urban. And so we're trying to continue to improve the techniques to ensure that the algorithms are as strong as possible. Next slide. Overall, the key idea that brings all this together is actually very similar to what was shared by the Valuables team, asking what kind of decisions do humans need to make, whether it's uh, working with the Ghana EPA to think about which areas need to be controlled better for regulating mining practices, or whether it's looking at a company and a community, trying to think about how local, fish, local, fish, local fishing practices and local uh, management of invasive plant need to change. In all these cases, we see there's a need to bring in an environmental set of data and social and economic data as well. So throughout our projects, uh, throughout my team, we try to bring together this kind of framework and then develop both tools and user interfaces with the tools that are friendly, but bring together this information in a combined way. It also lets us ask if new technology will be needed, such as new sources of drone data or local water sensors that can help improve the knowledge or validate the satellite information. Next slide. It's been a pleasure to present to you. You can learn more about the project at our website, spaceenabled.media.mit.edu. And I want to return to giving credit and thanks to all our collaborators in Benin and Ghana, as well as to the researchers at NASA Goddard, as well as at East Carolina University. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Wood. All right, now we will continue to explore ecological forecasting with a presentation from Sarah Hafer, a developed participant at our Pocatello, Idaho location. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, my name is Sarah Hafer, and I will be representing the NASA developed team from the Pocatello, Idaho node. Our project was focused on ecological forecasting and land cover types in the Mark Twain National Forest. Next slide, please. The Mark Twain National Forest, located in the Missouri Ozarks, has experienced a decline in its historic shortleaf pine oak woodlands due to unregulated logging and fire suppression practices of early settlers at the beginning of the 19th century. The Mark Twain National Forest is home to many diverse species that are dependent on shortleaf pine and glade habitats for survival. There are ongoing efforts in the forest to restore these natural communities to their historic range, as indicated at the bottom of our map on the right. Currently, the 11 Point and Poplar Bluff Ranger Districts in the bottom right are involved in the Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Project that is aimed at shortleaf pine restoration. And the Ava District, which is towards the bottom left, is engaged in clear cutting and prescribed fire to remove encroaching eastern red cedar from glade habitats. Our team has two objectives. The first was to create a land cover type analysis of Mark Twain National Forest that can be used to assist with species level classifications. The second was to forecast changes in land cover composition out to the year 2040 under current management practices. These objectives will aid our partners at the U.S. Forest Service in efficient and targeted restoration efforts. Next slide, please. Landsat 5 thematic mapper and Landsat 8 operational land imager data were acquired through Google Earth Engine. Within Google Earth Engine, the acquired data were processed to produce composite images and in several indices, including normalized difference vegetation index, enhanced vegetation index, normalized and normalized difference water index. Elevation data from the national elevation data set were processed to produce a digital elevation model, aspect, and slope layers. These layers, along with the trading data created by our team, were used to perform a pixel-based supervised classification in ArcGIS Pro with the Random Trees classifier. The, resulted, the resulting classified images had five classes, conifer forest, deciduous forest, meadow, developed, and water. Finally, Idrisi's Terraset land change modeler was utilized to access, assess the land cover changes between 1986 and 2019. These changes were then extrapolated to predict land cover changes out to 2040. Next slide, please. 
Here we have our results from the supervised classification for 1986 and 2019, and a graph indicating the net change between these years. The classification was achieved with kappa accuracies of 0.86 and 0.81 for 1986 and 2019 respectively, indicating very strong agreement between the classification results and validation data. As shown in the graph, we can see a significant decrease in conifer forest and meadowland between the years 1986 and 2019, while there was a significant increase in deciduous forest. It's important to note that in 2019, there was extreme flooding in Missouri, which may account for the increase of water. Next slide, please. These images show our results for forecasting out to the year 2040. On the bottom left is our predicted land cover classification for the entire forest based on current management practices and restoration efforts. Our forecasting model focused on six primary transition potentials between conifer forest, deciduous forest, and meadow, as these land cover transitions are most important to our partners at the Mark Twain National Forest. The graph above shows that there is a predicted net increase in conifer forest and meadow land cover, accompanied by a decrease in deciduous forest. On the right, we have a time, seri of time series of land cover change in two districts that are actively engaged in restoration projects. We can especially see the decrease in conifer trees between 1986 and 2019, along with the potential for widespread scatter, scattered conifer regrowth in 2040 if restoration efforts are successful. Our results indicate that the current restoration efforts in Mark Twain National Forest have a strong potential to succeed in restoring natural shortleaf pine and glade communities if they are continued into the future. Moving forward, our partners at the U.S. Forest Service can use these products to identify where shortleaf pine is disappearing to deciduous forest and where glades are being encroached by the eastern red cedar to carry out efficient and targeted restoration. Future studies would require more in-situ data in order to complete a species level classification to spectrally separate shortleaf pine and eastern red cedar from other forest types. Additionally, the 2040 land cover forest model can be combined with other transition driving variables such as soil type, insect infestations, and changing climate to increase the overall forest accuracy under various scenarios. Next slide, please. We'd like to thank our science advisor, Keith Weber and Mason Bull for all of your support through the project and thank you to our project partners at the Mark Twain National Forest. Thank you. Thank you so much for presenting today, Sarah. So now we're going to switch over a little bit and please welcome Kevin Murphy, Program Executive for the Earth Science Data Systems Program. Hey there, Kevin, we can see you, but we can't hear you just yet. Okay, let's see if that works. Is that better? There we go, yep. All right, thank you. It's been a pleasure to be uh, uh, here today and, and also to be listening to everybody's presentations. Um, I'll just give you a really quick overview of uh, what we do in the Earth Science Data System Program um, at NASA. Uh, can I get the next slide, please? Okay. Um, the Earth Science Data System Program um, is really responsible and it's an essential, well, responsible for all the data that comes out of um, the Earth Science Division. Um, that's from the airplanes, that's from ground activities, that's from uh, satellites, international collaborations, collaborations with other um, agencies, um, and in some instances, research products. And we're really responsible for managing this data and making it publicly available um, to everybody um, uh, throughout the world using an open data, so uh, open data policy and, and re more recently an open software policy. Um, we developed some unique tools. Maybe you've used Worldview, maybe you've used some of our search clients um, to find uh, the products that we have, but also to support rigorous science and applied science user investigations into these data. We've processed data from MODIS and VIRS and many of the other EOS um, satellites um, and reprocess those to improve the products over time. Um, and we engage with the science community and, in the evolution of the data systems through user working groups, through um, uh, surveys and, and, and community outreach activities. Um, and, and we also try to work with, with folks doing, you know, um, uh, pro by providing user services and training. Um, one of the things that we've done recently, if you um, look at earthdata.nasa.gov, is set up um, a series of articles related to um, data pathfinders. So how do you use data for, you know, investigating extreme heat events? Or how do you use data with GIS software packages? Or how do you, um, look at aerosol data and what is the best data to use for specific things. 
Um, and the way that we do this, the way that we manage um, these, you know, thousands and thousands of data sets and, and almost a billion files, I think, um, is, is through two primary projects, one located at the Goddard Space Flight Center, um, who has a number of ads up, by the way. Um, so if you're interested in uh, uh, government employment and data science, um, I would strongly suggest you go and check them out. Um, I think they're pretty short, so, you know, um, duration. So you should go look at USA Jobs Today if you're so interested. Um, and, and that's the ESIS project there out of Goddard. Um, and, and they really manage the DAX and, and, and these other systems, um, the big components. Um, we also have a, a group down at um, the Marshall Space Flight Center called Impact, um, and they they kind of do more of the advanced concepts and 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 interagency activities and relations. Next slide. Um, and this gets interesting. Oh, well, I guess the chart got a little messed up here, um, but <clears throat> um, you know this is kind of how much data we have to deal with and, and kind of the scale of our problem. It's a relatively simple line graph. Um, but what you see in kind of the dark green is the size of our archive. Um, and that first letter right here um, uh, in 2020 is kind of where we are today. Um, we have around 33 petabytes of data, 34 petabytes of data in our archives. Um, but as we kind of look forward to new missions that are launching, um, specifically the surface water and ocean topology mission um, and the NISAR mission, which is kind of the, the last thing on that green slope, um, you see that, that our, our annual growth rate, that light green line, um, increases quite substantially. It increases from where we are today, which is around, you know, uh, three to four petabytes, five petabytes a day, all the way up to, I mean, a, a year to about 50 petabytes a year um, in the, the 2022 time range. So obviously there are new challenges here. There are new opportunities um, uh, to make these products available to people. But we have to evolve the systems. We have to, to utilize um, uh, contemporary techniques um, and, and advanced techniques to make these large amounts of data available to lots of people um, around the world with NASA's free and open data policy. So obviously, working, we're looking at commercial cloud environments, and those types of environments um, really support um, a lot of capabilities that I'll talk about on the next slide. Um, but we also need to use things like machine learning. We also have to train um, uh, people up on how to use these new technologies. And we have to partner um, with external organizations and commercial companies um, to make this work well. Next slide, please. So one of the big activities that we've been working on for the past four or so years, and it's kind of complicated because, you know, we have to work within government guidelines and regulations um, for purchasing things and for IT security and all those types of things. Um, but we've really been working with the commercial industry to develop this thing called Earth Data Cloud. And the objectives of Earth Data Cloud are to improve the efficiency of NASA's data systems and operations while continuing the free and open access to the data, all right, prepare for these high rate data missions like NISAR and SWAT, um, which will produce files that could be up to 30 gigabytes in size each, um, which could be a little difficult to process on, on your own laptop um, unless you have something pretty big, especially if you want to do time series analysis. We also want to increase the opportunity for researchers, applied scientists, commercial users, almost anybody really, to access the petabytes of data um, uh, that we manage quickly without the need for data management. Um, and, and this is a really important point because today, you know, if, if you go and try to do a global study or a large regional study, you have to go and, and uh, accumulate all those data products. You have to do the management, um, the downloading, uh, make sure it's all properly um, indexed on your your own computer, and then run your analysis. What we envision here is using these commercial environments. Um, users can simply go and, and you know, um, obtain an account, download, or not download, but utilize software that we would provide, and do some basic analysis that they must use, uh, that they that they want to perform. Um, likewise, we're partnering with, with the major cloud vendors to, to make the data available within the tools that they may have. Um, so if you look at like Google Earth Engine or or some of the others, um, we're trying to make it easier for them to access this information uh, quickly as well. Um, and finally, we're doing this all in the open. Where you, if you look at NASA GitHub, um, you can see um, the primary software that we use for Earth Data Cloud is, is developed in the open, it's tested in the open, and, and it allows for contributions um, from the scientific research or data science community. Next slide, please.
Um, can you play this one? Thank you. Um, so, you know, one of the big problems that we have is, is that, you know, we accumulate all of this data every year. Um, and, and it comes at a, a, a faster and faster rate, and, and often it's more complex. Um, so what we try to do is utilize um, specialized techniques to help people discover interesting information a little bit more um, uh, easily. And in this instance, we're using a machine learning technique to um, identify uh, phenomena, uh, uh, phenomena in, in, in particular, you know, uh, location or grid boxes. Um, and what we do here is we use, you know, um, uh, 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 label-based data sets um, and some uh, machine learning techniques um, to identify areas of, of high latitude dust or smoke um, uh, <clears throat> or other kind of phenomena that people may be interested in. So this is just one of those, those new tools that we would develop to allow people to find the information um, uh, and, and actually support our ability to explore our data a little bit more. And this builds on our, our strategy of making everything open um, and, and uh, within the cloud. So it uses machine learning um, within Amazon, I believe in this instance, it also uses our, our global imagery browse services um, for the image detection and mining. Um, and it kind of runs this continuously. Um, and this is just a demonstration. You can check it out here. Next slide, please. And one more because it just that's the uh, animation. Um, so thank you very much. I think uh, you know you may have a lot of questions. Um, I'm not exactly sure how we uh, uh, present this or how we answer those. Um, but again, if you're if you're uh, a data scientist or a, 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 a another type of scientist and you would like to, to check out the opportunities available at the Ezra's Project at Goddard, please go ahead and look at usajobs.gov and, and put your resume in. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Kevin, and thanks for sharing that perspective. Up next, we're going to highlight water resources with a presentation from Dr. Chris Martinez from the Water Institute at the University of Florida. Let's see, Dr. Martinez, if you're speaking, we cannot hear you yet. Can you hear me now? We sure can. Go right ahead. Okay, great, great. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, uh, a new project that we're one year in. It's uh, funded by the NASA Water Res Roses Water Resources Program. Uh, it's a collaboration between the University of Florida, the Center for Ocean Atmospheric Prediction Studies at Florida State University, uh, Tampa Bay Water, who's a, a wholesale water supplier, municipal water supplier, and also the Peace River, Minnesota Regional Water Supply Authority. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we're part of the Florida Water and Climate Alliance. We're a stakeholder scientist group that formed in 2010, and we've been meeting regularly ever since. Uh, we've done 21 workshops so far. Uh, the, the entire goal of this group is to increase the usability and adoption of climate information in water resource management. Uh, we're rather an interesting group in that in that we we uh, we're grassroots. Uh, the idea for forming this group actually came from some of our partner utilities who spoke to e each other and said, "Well, you're doing some climate stuff. We're doing some climate stuff. We should probably be talking to each other, and we should probably also be uh, get to know what's going on at the uh, universities it, 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 in the, in the state." Uh, so, next slide, please. Uh, so this is an overview of the entire uh, project. Our idea is to use remotely sensed data, such as soil moist, moisture, uh, leaf area index, to characterize the land surface over peninsular Florida, uh, use this information to initialize regional se seasonal climate forecasts for the state, uh, evaluate these forecasts in hydrologic forecasts. We have several models to, to do this, 
and use this information in source allocation choices. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a moment. Um, and another unique feature of, of our project is that we have a social scientist on the team who's, who's going to be studying the decision-making process from beginning uh, to end. So next slide, please. Uh, so why are we doing this? Uh, Florida has a very distinct wet and dry seasons. Uh, even though we're a very wet state, uh, we've been dependent on groundwater for municipal water supply for decades, and we're overdrawing it in many parts of, of the, the state. We're seeing saltwater intrusion on the coasts. Uh, we're seeing dewatering of wetlands and lakes in other parts of, of the uh, state. Uh, so now a lot of utilities are moving away from, from just using groundwater for mun municipal water supply. Uh, so our partners on this project, uh, one utility doesn't use any groundwater at all. They have a, an aquifer storage and recovery system, which is the largest east of, of the Mississippi. Uh, and the way this works is that they with, withdraw water during the wet se se season, inject it underground, and pull it back up when they, 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 they need that water. Uh, our other utility, Tampa Bay Water, uses a combination of groundwater, uh, direct ri river withdrawals, uh, an offline reservoir, and they have a, a deep desalination plant. Uh, so when you think about reservoirs, uh, reservoir in Florida is not the same as it is in other parts of the state because we have so little uh, top topography. Uh, so the amount of water that we can actually store in a reservoir is actually pretty limited. They tend to be these big concrete lined holes in, in the ground, base, basically. So very shallow, very wide, so you get a lot of ev evaporation off of of these re reservoirs. Uh, so in terms of using these different sources of water, whether it be groundwater, surface water, aquifer storage and recovery water, or desalinated water, there's very different costs to, to these, these three, three, three type, these types of, of, of water. So the idea of this project is how can we use seasonal climate forecasts to use the right water at the right time to minimize costs as well as environmental impacts. Next slide, please. Uh, so we're in the first year of this project. So we've, we've developed our regional climate forecast, which was no small effort. Uh, so from 2000 to 2019, uh, we're, we've developed forecasts for November, December, January, and December, January, February. Um, these are at a 10 kilometer resolution for the entire state. Uh, what's important about that is because uh, we're surrounded by water on three three sides, actually having a high resolution forecast becomes fairly important to really get the land uh, ocean interaction in in terms of uh, our our climate. Uh, so what we've done is that we've run five different global climate models uh, and six regional climate models to give us an ensemble of thirty forecasts for the dry sea. Season. Uh, on top of that, we've archived this, this uh, data daily and monthly for 32 var variables for our, our uh, stakeholders as well as anyone else who, who would like to use it. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is just an example of, uh, of, of a, a mean precipitation that we've, we've developed. Uh, the top row is the observations. Second row is, is the ensemble mean for the two seasons, and, and the third row is, is the amount of error that we're getting in, in our forecast. So our, our error is fairly modest, uh, and also these forecasts are really just our baseline, because what we haven't done yet is to integrate uh, remotely sensed soil moisture uh, and leaf area index in terms of initializing our forecast. So, that's, so these are the forecasts that we're going, we're going to compare any improvement to. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so in terms of what we're going to do, we're going to integrate these forecasts in, into multiple hydrologic models that we already have developed. Uh, they're both statistical and phys physical models. Uh, our utility that uses aquifer storage and recovery already has a, what they call an aquifer storage and recovery index, which takes multiple in inputs, including drought status, current stream flow, uh, climate prediction center out outlooks, 
So what, what we want to see is, is how much better can we do using a, a more highly resolved forecast as well as a, a remotely sensed soil moisture to, uh, to give us an idea of drought status at, at a certain period of time, period in, in time. And the whole idea of this aquifer storage and recovery index is just to say, when should we turn on those aquifer storage and recovery wells? Uh, and then all through this, this, this project, we're going to be assessing the process and, of decision making and adoption of, of our, our forecasts. Uh, you know, where and, and, and how does in, information plug into the decision making process? Uh, trying to understand also uh, the different uh, uh, governance structures of our, 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 our two utilities and any kind of institutional restraints that they might have. So the, the whole idea here is not to build it first and hope it gets used, uh, but to understand things and, and to, to build it along with our, our stakeholders as we go. Uh, and then also we want to understand what the, what the impacts of our champions are. And what do I mean by that? These are our stakeholders who are really, really excited and really into it and have influence amongst other uh, uh, stakeholders to get on board. Uh, so for this project, we're focusing on just two utilities, uh, but we're, we want to involve the entire group of the Florida Water and, and Climate Alliance in this whole process and see if they might also be interested in, in using our forecasts too. Uh, next slide, please. And that's all that I have. Uh, these two uh, wordles, uh, the first one is from 2010. That was one of our first meetings when, when we did a need assessment amongst our stakeholders. And the one in 2019, that was a, a steering committee meeting that we had, well, last, last year and the size and the frequency of the different words just shows how often these words were mentioned in those meetings. So it gives you just a snapshot of what our stakeholders are really thinking about. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Martinez. And I love that visualization here at the end. So now we're going to continue to explore water resources applications with a presentation from Elizabeth Wen, a developed participant at Langley Research Center. Hi, thank you so much, Sydney. Hi everyone, my name is Elizabeth Wynn, presenting on the behalf of Ella Griffith, Trista Brophy, and Addie Smith. Thanks for tuning in. Today I'll be talking about the work the Riley County Water Resources team did on runoff analysis and how various methods can help predict and inform flood re flooding resiliency planning. Due to climate change, seasonal variation, urbanization, and land use land cover change, flooding has increasingly impacted communities around the world, including Riley County, Kansas. As with other areas, flooding risk is influenced by development patterns, channel maintenance, runoff, and land use. In order to get a more detailed picture of how these factors might affect flooding, this study analyzed patterns in runoff potential. Our partners were interested in tracking land use land cover changes in the county along with runoff risk in order to inform future resiliency planning and strategies to mitigate and avoid future floods. Next slide, please. Specifically, the team conducted two methods of curve number calculations from 2006 to 2019, both annually and with seasonal variation. Curve numbers are an engineering metric which predicts the amount of runoff versus infiltration based off variables associated with the soil and cover type. The traditional Soil Conservation Service curve number calculation, shown in blue, uses a static lookup table and tracked land use land cover, soil groups, hydrological conditions, and a slope map to determine runoff changes. The land use and land cover data were taken from the cropland data layer and the national land cover database released by the USGA and the USGS. These tables allow for crop specific curve number and accounts for various farming techniques, but require many inputs and lack flexibility. The dynamic method employed normalized difference vegetation index, NDVI, which is a reflection of vegetation density and health compiled over the rainy season each year to calculate curve number using that seasonal vegetation. Images taken were taken using Landsat 5, 7, and 8, processed in Google Earth Engine. This method allows for a more precise analysis of runoff variability, both within and between rainy seasons, because it can be updated with greater temporal detail and captures higher spatial resolutions by using NDVI as a proxy for land use land cover. 
The map on top shows the conventional curve number change analysis during the study period across Riley County. The blue area is referring to a decrease in curve number and thus a decrease in runoff risk, while the red area is referred to an increase in curve number and an increase in runoff risk. The bottom map demonstrates the same change analysis using the dynamic method based on NDVI. The higher the NDVI values, the healthier the vegetation is and the more infiltration versus runoff and area experiences and thus less flooding. Next slide, please. These two maps demonstrate the seasonal variation within the rainy seasons from 2006 to 2019. The early rainy season runs from March to May with the late rainy season running from June to September. As demonstrated in the maps, the pink and red areas refer to higher curb numbers and higher runoff risk. Higher runoff risk occurs in the early rainy season and the map on the left as seen in the northern upland part of the state. These variations are largely due to changes in crop and flora phenological cycles within the year. Next slide, please. So overall, the team created an updated crop specific land use and land cover maps over the study period and analyzed these changes in land cover. Grassland, which is the most prevalent land cover in the county, decreased by 11%. Developed areas, including urban land cover with impervious surface areas, which had the highest amounts of runoff, increased by 6% over just 13 years. The team also produced tutorials to calculate curve number employing both methods to continue to track runoff risk and inform future flooding resiliency planning and policy. Overall, the dynamic curve number showed greater temporal analysis, more vari var variability, and allowed for a seasonal analysis versus the conventional method, which can only be calculated on year-to-year -year changes. The dynamic method can be updated bi-monthly and with much fewer inputs. Overall, the team found increased flood risk due to runoff in 2.67% of the county in the study period of just 13 years. This demonstrates that land use and land cover changes over even a short period of time can greatly impact flood risk, and even variability within a year can do so, as seen with the seasonal analysis. Increased runoff flooding risk calls for resiliency and mitigation planning, which will be more informed with risk analysis and curve number maps to pinpoint the areas of highest risk. Next slide, please. I'd like to thank my team, our partners, and our developed support team for making this project happen, and thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, and great job to your team. We're now going to take one more short break for another poll, so please take a moment to respond and we will resume shortly. I'd also like to take this time to remind you that we have our Mapathon running all week long, and you can find more information about that on the website for the event. And additionally, at 2.15 p.m. today, Eastern Time, we will break into our breakout rooms. So if you have any questions that you'd like to ask our presenters today, you can join the appropriate thematic breakout room and ask your questions there. Great, thank you so much for your participation in this poll. We will now hear from Emily Adams, Eastern and Southern Africa Science Coordination Lead and Gender Point of Contact at Servier. Welcome, Emily. Hi, everyone, thank you. Can you hear me? We sure can, yep. Okay, unfortunately, I couldn't quite get my camera to work, um, but thank you all for having me. Uh, my name is Emily Adams, and um, I'm representing the Eastern and Southern Africa Sci as the Science Coordination Lead. Um, I'm going to give you a very small snapshot of some of the research that's being done through Servier on the African continent. Uh, next slide, please. So Servier is a joint NASA and USAID program that works with regional institutions around the world to build their capacity to use Earth observation data for their development challenges. Our approach involves connecting with these regional institutions um, to build their capacity, and these institutions are seen here on the map. 
Um, our youngest hub, Severe Amazonia, is based out of Siat in Cali, Colombia. Uh, Severe West Africa, based at Agramet in Niamey, Niger. Severe Eastern and Southern Africa, based at RCMRD in Nairobi, Kenya. Severe Hindu Kush Himalaya, based at ECMOD in Kathmandu, Nepal. And Severe Mekong at ADPC in Bangkok, Thailand. Um, I will be focusing this presentation on the work that's being done in Africa. But my colleague Andrea gave an awesome presentation yesterday about our Amazonia hub, and my colleague Tim will be presenting the work on Asia tomorrow. Um, so I'm also showing here the four application areas where we focus our service development, um, agriculture and food security, water and water related disasters, land use, land cover change and ecosystems, and weather and climate. And one of the, the benefits of having this global network um, is not only being able to develop services in these regions, but leveraging the expertise developed in these regions and bringing them to other regions, allowing for replication of services or scaling of services when the needs arise. Next slide, please. And one of the ways in which we do that, in, in which we develop our services, is through what we call our service planning toolkit. Um, so Chris Martinez did a really nice job speaking to this actually. Um, and here's just a short infographic about really the backbone of our work, which starts with the needs of the decision makers. So rather than developing a science product that, um, that we hope is useful for someone somewhere, we rather identify key stakeholders in our application areas and really focus our service development um, in that co-development process uh, with collective coding and collective collaboration along the entire service development process, which is what you are seeing in this um, applic or in this infographic here, and constantly circling back to those stakeholders and needs assessments, um, which results in improved decision making. Next slide, please. So. As an example of some of the services that we've been developing in, in West Africa and Eastern and Southern Africa um, are, are listed here. So we, for Eastern and Southern Africa, um, the ones on top, we've looked at uh, drought monitoring and assessments, frost monitoring, stream flow and flood forecasting, land cover mapping, uh, climate vulnerability, and crop monitoring and area estimation. And I'll be giving you a little bit more information about the crop monitoring and area estimation in a moment. And then West Africa, which is also, I should note, is a consortium of institutions. The, the host um, institution is Agramet, which is based in Niamey, but there are um, five additional institutions that are engaged in the consortium, which are listed at the bottom of the slide. Um, and they've been uh, working on uh, services, including surface water body mapping, groundwater monitoring and modeling, charcoal production monitoring, locust infestation monitoring, which I'll also be giving you more information about here in a moment. Uh, monitoring of artisanal mine mining or Galamse in Ghana, and also support for commune level development planning in Burkina Faso. And if you'd like to know more about these services, and um, they are on our website under our service catalog. Uh, so next slide, please. One of the ways that we bring um, some state of the art science to the regions that we work is through our applied sciences teams. So these are three year award cycles uh, through the NASA ROSES solicitation process where uh, four scientists per region, so this iteration we have 20 scientists, um, bring their tools and capabilities uh, directly to the region and work alongside our hub colleagues to develop new science products and solutions for the services that they are providing to their stakeholders. So here you see the four, um, the four scientist uh, principal investigators that are working in West Africa. Uh, Norm Jones is uh, working on uh, groundwater management in West Africa. Jasmeet Judge is looking at deforestation and agricultural ex uh, and urbanization and agricultural expansion in Ghana. Pontus Olafsson is um, also working on land change and forest degradation in West Africa and Shred Shukla is integrating satellite earth observations and, and climate forecasts for agricultural and pastoral uh, water management decision making. Next slide, please. And these are our four uh, Eastern and Southern Africa 
principal investigators from the Applied Sciences team. Um, Evan Thomas um, is using in situ data collection and remote sensing for improved um, hydrologic models for flood, drought, and agricultural forecasting. Uh, Niall Hanan is doing some range monitoring and, and uh, for pastoral livelihoods and uh, forage in the arid and semi-arid regions of Eastern and Southern Africa. Catherine Nakalembe, who is also representing uh, NASA Harvest, um, is using Earth observations for national agricultural monitoring. And Frank Davenport um, is using Earth observations to enhance drought, food security, and agricultural outlooks. And as you can kind of see, uh, particularly illustrated from these four principal investigators, there's a lot of, of overlap, um, and comp not necessarily overlap, but complementarity between uh, these four uh, these four projects, which is really amazing and one of the reasons why we call it an applied sciences team, because even though these four PIs were chosen through a very, um, through the ROSES process, we're now able to work together um, and leverage each other's products, each other's um, expertise, and, and build things that support the hubs in a more team-related environment. So this happens both um, among the team for Eastern and Southern Africa, but also across all of the applied sciences team members that have been selected across the whole uh, global, severe global um, network. Next slide, please. Um, so as I mentioned before, I was gonna dig into the services a little bit more uh, just to showcase some of the work that our, our colleagues are doing. Um, so here's a little bit of more information about monitoring illegal mining, which is called Galamse in Ghana. Uh, so Galamse has been driving deforestation um, in Ghana, contributing to water pollution and land degradation, uh, and just overall really having an impact on the land. And being able to map those areas of illegal mining in forms where both monitoring activities need to take place as well as restoration interventions are needed. Uh, so the Severe West Africa team is working working um, to identify these areas. Uh, this is also an issue that is prevalent in the Amazon region, and the two hubs are learning a lot from each other as they map uh, these areas for their decision makers. Next slide, please. Uh, so um, a food security and agriculture example is the Regional Cropland Assessment and Monitoring Service. So this is one of the, the services that one of our AST is supporting, Catherine Nakalembe. So together with um, our CMRD, they have helped develop these crop bulletins, which are currently being produced um, by an end user um, in the region called ICPAC. So the bulletin is featured here on the right-hand side of your slide. Um, and they also, as a part of this service, have developed satellite-derived crop masks and a sampling framework for the Kenya um, insurance program. So the agricultural uh, part of the, the Kenya government has an insurance program for farmers that um, previously was quite expensive to run, so they were not able to insure very many farmers because of the high overhead expense where the insurance agents would have to go out into the fields, into rural areas to collect samples from the farms, which often had very small acreage and it was just very, very expensive. Uh, but the satellite derived information reduced costs by 70%, uh, which allowed the insurance protection program to expand from 900 farmers all the way up to almost half a million farmers in all of the agriculturally important counties in Kenya. Um, so in 2019, when there was uh, a loss event, now 12,000 farmers were, were able to get compensation for their crop losses. So this, this type of system we're already seeing is having an impact with the satellite derived information. Next slide, please. Another thing that we've been able to do is um, help illustrate the benefit of, of water infrastructure that had been developed by other programs, um, but uh, just assessing the, the before and after impacts of these infrastructure programs, including things like building dams for increased water access. So you can see on the right hand side of your slide uh, image from 2006 before any intervention uh, had taken place. And then in 2019, around the same time period of the year, you can see 
the, just the increase in amount of agriculture in the region. And we can tell by using things like NDVI that average greenness at these project sites is higher than before the intervention had been taking place. Um, there's increased water availability during these drought years. There's faster vegetation recovery at these locations where water infrastructure exists and water access has improved such that instead of having one cropping season, there is now in some cases an additional cropping season increasing food security in the region. Um, so we did this as a small pilot test case to see if this was something that was worth investing more time in and it turned out to be really beneficial analysis. So we're able to scale this up for additional regions where these types of interventions had taken place, including additional sites in Ethiopia and in Niger. Next slide, please. And finally, um, talking a little bit about uh, the locust, as I mentioned. So in response to the recent unprecedented upsurge in desert locust activity in East Africa, you, you might have heard about this in the news. It's uh, quite amazing to see the videos of, of the locust swarms. Um, so we have worked in collaboration with NASA Harvest, uh, NASA Disasters, the Food and Agricultural Organization, who is really the um, the lo desert locust uh, warehouse for all of this information and, and decision makers look to them to provide desert locust information um, to map and model high resolution soil moisture. So these desert locusts lay their eggs in moist sandy soils. Uh, so we've used this high resolution soil moisture map, which is seen here on the right um, with maps of soil type uh, to identify the areas that are at the highest risk for egg laying activities. And this is kind of crucial information because being able to target control measures when they're doing the egg laying and before the locusts are mobile is, is a really critical point in time to intervene and try to reduce uh, the population size of the locusts um, in the region. And once again, this is an example of learning across our hubs. So Severe West Africa is also a region that's impacted by locusts uh, quite regularly. Um, and so they had, before this upsurge in East Africa, they had been developing a locust service and the two hubs have been working together to try to um, learn from each other and get information and between each of the hubs in support of understanding this activity. Next slide, please. So finally, I just wanted to touch a little bit on my other role with SEVERE as the gender point of contact. Uh, so SEVERE recognized that, um, there, that um, women and are often overlooked, um, both because there are fewer women in, in, in science around the world and also in the service planning that we design and co-develop. And so we have decided on four gender related and social inclusion related goals that help us identify ways in which we can support the network towards being a more inclusive uh, service provider. Uh, so the first two goals seen here are empowering women leaders and gender champions, both uh, within our severe networks and um, during any outreach activities with, with other institutions or groups that we may come into contact with. Um, and the second two goals here are integrating gender considerations into our service planning, which was that first infographic that I showed about uh, needs assessments and consultations and co-development and, and using remote sensing and GIS to in address development issues that are inclusive of underrepresented groups, including uh, women and minorities and indigenous peoples and groups like that. And this helps us understand uh, the full breadth of, of the picture as we uh, organize and, and co-develop our services. Next slide, please. So thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to present. If you have any questions, my contact information is listed there. And Emil Charrington is the um, lead for Severe West Africa. So feel free to reach out. And I'd like to thank the whole Severe Network for helping support all of this work. Great, thank you so much, Emily. So to close out our presentations today, we'll hear from Dr. Shanna McLean, who serves a dual role as manager of Earth Sciences Division Global Partnerships and as a risk reduction and resilience advisor for the Applied Sciences Program. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Sydney. Um, so uh, I'm going to take today to talk a little bit about the partnerships work um, that 
I'm doing, but uh, certainly not alone. It's really representative of a vast network of people um, and a lot of really, I think, interesting uh, vision and, um, and collaboration. And so I'd just like to start by saying that even though this global partnerships program isn't housed explicitly in applied sciences, each partnership that I'll talk about today does have an applications focus. And we in, received just an incredible amount of support and guidance from Lawrence Friedel and from a really across applied sciences as a whole. Next slide. And so to talk a little bit about what makes these partnerships unique, um, I'll start just by saying that they were built with the intention that we go a little bit outside of our comfort zone. Uh, usually we're, we're very comfortable with, with working with space agencies or with academic institutions, but the partnerships activity was really meant to explore what it would be like to work with private corporations, nonprofits, non-governmental organizations, and others. Um, this allows us, I think, not only uh, an opportunity to learn how to work with other entities, but then also how to learn how they work, um, which makes us a lot more nimble as well as able to advance and really, I think, uh, reach a greater impact with our Earth observation science. A uh, second reason um, for instituting this activity was really to understand what it would be like to use this learning uh, towards a shared a set of capacities. Um, and so we are founded under the idea that we will not exchange funds, that we instead uh, dedicate our time, our resources, our capacities towards tackling some of the challenges and complexities that we'll be looking at today uh, together. Finally, I'd like to mention that these partnerships don't have just the, the main role of advancing how science and earth observations can be used for societal benefits or for science-based information and decision-making, but also to really broaden the, the reach that we have, the number of communities that can see the value of what collaborations like this can do uh, for them, uh, for how they see the world and impact lives directly. Next slide, please. And so we'll turn now just to the four partnerships that are currently ongoing under this activity. Uh, these are partnerships with Conservation International, Google, Mercy Corps and Microsoft. Next slide. And we'll start with a little bit of information on the Conservation International uh, and NASA partnership. So there are two main activities that are taking place under this partnership. Uh, I would start by saying that Conservation International is a, a, an incredibly well-known and well-trusted um, American nonprofit organization focused on the ability to, or the interest of conserving and preserving our natural resources and the benefits that they bring us, uh, you know, food, water, uh, climate stabilization, et cetera. The activities that we're looking at um, occur at different levels or different scales of intervention. The first is the Gaborone Declaration for Sustainability in Africa. This declaration was signed by the countries that you see reflected in the map in the upper left corner um, in, in chartreuse or green or yellow of some sort. Um, but essentially, it's a set of countries that are assigning themselves um, to the fact that natural resources play a vital role in their country's development. And so what NASA and CI are doing together with the signatories of the Gaborone Declaration are developing a platform for the evaluation, monitoring, and valuation of the resources within these countries. This would directly enable um, people like you see here, which is the Liberian EPA, to understand not only what resources that they have available in their country, but what the value is that's assigned to them when they're either um, losing the resources or able to protect them in a particular way. The second activity that we have referenced on the, the screen here is the freshwater health index work. 
This is largely happening at the basin level, and we've been having ongoing activities both in the, um, the Mekong River Basin as well as the Okavango River Basin. Uh, this work that you see reflected here is with OCRICOM, the Okavango River Basin Commission. And the idea here is really to focus on elements related to ecosystem health and vitality, um, the services, again, that they bring, um, but then also what stakeholders and governance mechanisms are in place to support these activities. I would say that collaboratively, um, the work with CI and, and NASA has been really incredible in advancing, I think, a lot of the way that we are able to monitor and evaluate ecosystem services for improved conservation efforts. Next slide, please. So the second partnership we'll talk about is the one between NASA and Google. Google is a multinational technology company focused on internet services. It's definitely private. Um, uh, but we've got a, a few different activities going on here. And I think it's really been interesting to see the diversity um, that, that plays out as a result of working with them. The first work that we're doing is really focused on data inventory and enhancement, meaning that NASA's data is free and open. And when it's brought onto a platform like Google Earth Engine, Together, we want to make sure that it is available and accessible in the in, in following its intended purposes or use. And so there's a lot of optimization of data that's taking place, cataloging, and ensuring that when you access particular data sets, that they're fit for the intended purpose. The second activity that we have going on with Google is between NASA's comms team or communications team and NASA or, uh, Google Earth and the Google Earth Voyager platform. It's really a joint communications effort trying to share the stories collectively that we have about not only the value of Earth observations, but what this means from a storytelling perspective. And so here you see one of the elements that we collaborated on, uh, scenes from space, but we also have other elements like the ABCs from space, which give you a way to look at different points around the world, understand not only how Earth observations can be used to, to look at different things in our environment, but then also what it means from, um, you know, from a, I think from a, a more personal perspective, like how it impacts us, what it means to us to be able to see things like this. The final activity is an emerging project that will incorporate um, all of these elements um, at, through time, but it's really beginning with Google's science team that's focused on air quality and health, and our NASA scientists that also look at air quality and health, and together we'll be looking at societal benefits through sustainable development. This work is really um, going to kick off mainly in the fall, um, so more to come on this in the future, but uh, I think it's just a really exciting opportunity, um, and so I think it'll be uh, interesting to see more as we move forward. Next slide, please. The third partnership is with Mercy Corps. Mercy Corps is an international non-governmental organization focused on the provision of humanitarian aid, uh, primarily in fragile and vulnerable contexts. Uh, this activity with them, this partnership, also has three pr pr uh, primary projects. Um, the first one is really looking at the concept of resilience. And so Mercy Corps has a particular methodology for understanding and building community resilience globally. And so what we're trying to do with them is understand what complementary approaches and Earth observations can be used. And the focus here is really on the number of new dams that are being um, developed across the Sahel region of Africa and what this means for impacts moving forward on already fragile communities. The second activity that we've got going on is between Servir, um, which you just heard a bit about and which has also played a theme throughout this week for Applied Sciences, um, and our partner Mercy Corps. Servir has a number of regional hubs doing incredible work with national governments, and Mercy Corps works often with climate services at the national level. And so together, they're really looking to advance a complementary capacity for global impact on climate services. The final activity I'll talk about under this partnership is 
working with an element of Mercy Corps called Agrifin. This is the agricultural and financing uh, work, which is working directly with smallholder farmers in Africa that are responsible for providing 85% of Africa's food supply. Together, NASA and Mercy Corps are building um, climate smart digital services to provide to the farmers so we can support food security in the face of climate change. Next. And finally, the fourth partnership that we have is with Microsoft, another private organization or company, but um, that's primarily focused on software and technology platforms. This activity is interesting because um, although the, the overarching element or goal is urban heat resilience, it's really a, set, a nested set of activities. And so we're working, uh, NASA and Microsoft are working together with the city of Chicago to understand impacts um, of urban heat on community vulnerability um, and hoping to enhance the timing of decisions to protect these communities. In order to do that, we're really working with a, a tremendous amount of climate data, uh, which requires a lot of storage and processing space. So we're working both with Microsoft, um, their Azure's cl uh, Azure Cloud Platform, as well as with Esri, to ensure that the data can be processed and integrated into a common platform that can be used by the city of Chicago and our partners. Next. And so with this, I'd just like to um, thank everyone for the opportunity to talk about the partnerships work today. If you have any questions, please do feel free to reach out to me and over to you. Thank you so much, Shanna. And a huge thank you to all of our excellent presenters today. I hope you will join our presenters in the breakout rooms starting at 2.15 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, so just after a short recess for further discussion and an opportunity to ask any questions you may have. You can find links to those breakout rooms on the event webpage or in the handout section here on GoToWebinar. And now for our closing remarks today, please welcome back Lawrence Friedel. Great. Thank you, Sydney. Really, really appreciate and really, really enjoyed your emceeing. So um, th thanks to all the speakers, as, as Sydney mentioned. Um, we really appreciate the, the talks by all the developed projects, fantastic projects, everyone. Uh, and really thanks to all the, the special guests. I was really glad. Uh, we could hear from Kevin Murphy and hearing about the data systems program uh, and all. So nice work, everyone. Uh, and also a special shout out to all the partners um, that uh, that we've been able to work with and who also helped a lot with the develop projects. Um, we heard about 11 overall today uh, and we had many, many attendees, several hundred attendees uh, at one point, um, actually at least 250 um, today. So it's been great. Uh, and then, as Sydney said, a reminder about the breakout sessions that are going to be coming up in about 15 minutes or so. Um, before we go ahead and look to day four, um, we do want to pay tribute to a man, Michael Freilich. Um, so Mike passed away very early this morning uh, from complications from pancreatic cancer. Uh, his family was, was by his side, uh, so they had some, some final moments with Mike. Uh, Mike was the director of the NASA Earth Science Division for about a dozen years or so, and he was he was highly, highly respected, highly trusted, um, and he retired in early 2019, and so it was just about 18 months ago when he retired, and I know he and his wife Shoshana were, were really looking forward to a long retirement together uh, and, and also looking to get back to the West Coast and their beloved Oregon. So, uh, so there was, was sort of a retirement cut short uh, for him. Um, I have to tell you, Mike was a really avid supporter of Develop, uh, and the summer showcase was one of the highlights for him for the year. Uh, you can see from the picture there that he loved his Develop t-shirts, and I know he had, he was very proud of his drawer full of Develop t-shirts, uh, and he was happy to, to bring them out every year for the, for the showcase. Um, Mike was also a really, really avid and fervent supporter of earth science and earth system science. Um, if you didn't get a chance, you, you really should have seen his presentations at the American Geophysical Union or the American Meteorological Society or, or many, many other sorts of um, venues. Uh, they were incredibly animated. Uh, they were informative. They were impactful. They were really, they were entertaining. Uh, and and it was a fantastic way to learn about Earth system science. Uh, and he really approached them like like the former professor that he was. He was always looking for a chance uh, to educate. 
Uh, and so we will certainly miss Mike uh, and our thoughts go out, go out to his family. Um, but knowing him, he would also want us to be looking forward. Um, and, and I think one of the ways that we can be doing this is to, to look forward to, to day four um, and look forward to more about Earth system science. Uh, and so with day four, uh, we're going to be having a focus on Eastern United States uh, and Asia. Uh, and so we're going to be having 12 talks. Six of them are going to be about develop. And we're also going to have a special presentation from RG Cavada about the use of Earth observations for the sustainable development goals. So we're going to start again at 12 noon Eastern time, which is 1600 UTC. Um, I do want to say, uh, a, again, a, a thanks to today's speakers, um, and especially you all as the attendees. Um, as we close out today, we are going to have a final poll um, uh, for you all, so please stick around to give us some input. Um, that's all for day three. We really look forward to talking with you and hearing and, and having you join tomorrow. Uh, and but before then, we really want to see you all in the breakout session. So we'll see you there in about 15 minutes. So thanks, everyone.